Suhail will start with the Kirat, and after that, Brother Adil Nahdi will do a presentation on Aira for a short while. Brother Adil Nahdi is the Africa representative of Aira. Inshallah, first we'll start with Brother Suhail. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. A'udhu billahi min al-shaytan al-rajim. Bismillahi al-Rahman al-Rahim. Alam nashrah lanka sadrak. ووضعنا عنك وزرك الذي أنقض ظهرك ألم نشرح لك صدرك ووضعنا عنك وزرك الذي قد ظهرك ورفعنا لك ذكرك فإن مع العسر يسرا إن مع العسر يسرا فإذا فرغت فانصب وإلى ربك فارغب صدقت يا رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته All praise is due to Allah. We praise Him. We seek His help and assistance and my peace and blessing be upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My dear beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, welcome to this event and we want to express our gratitude and thanks for coming from wherever you are here in Durban. It is my first time in Durban. The weather is better than Johannesburg, that's for sure, alhamdulillah. And I hope, inshallah, at the end of this evening, I get to meet some amazing thing that you do in this country and as a Muslim and the work that you're doing. Now, before I start, I don't like to see MTC at the front. So if you can kindly, those at the back, okay, come at the front. Come, all of you, get up, please, inshallah. Come sit at the front. You're, you guys are very important. You don't need to sit at the back. Okay, there's no VIP here. Okay, Allah, bismillah. All of you come to the front, inshallah, let's fill up the space so that those that can come late, they go and sit at the back. You guys deserve the front row reward, inshallah. Barakallahu feek. Okay, to begin with, let me do a small introduction about myself. My name is Adil Nahdi. I'm originally from Yemen. However, I, was, uh, I grew up in Tanzania, East Africa. So if some of you know Swahili, then maybe you can interact in that language. But I grew up most of my life in UK. I studied sociology, communication, culture, and philosophy, and then went to Egypt to do my Islamic studies. Now, alhamdulillah, I came from a family that does a lot of humanitarian work, and I've been working in the humanitarian sector for quite a few years. But I era, how did I join I era? Alhamdulillah, because of my beloved mother. May Allah have mercy on her. From the age of 16, she was pushing me to give da'wah. Now, I was not living in London. I was living in a city outside London called Milton Keynes. It's a small town where there is no da'wah at all. And me and my mother, may Allah have mercy on her, we continuously every week used to give da'wah until she has passed away. Our brothers and sisters... I did not know this, but my mom used to donate every month to IRA. How much? Five pounds, which is about, let's say, 100 rand. Okay? I only knew after she has passed away. 
Many years later, you know, I traveled and I did some little humanitarian work. Alhamdulillah, three years ago, I got the opportunity to apply to work for this amazing organization. And since I joined, Alhamdulillah, I arrow with an organization that does work in UK and Europe, but it has boomed and went across the six continents. I era, it stands for Islamic Education and Research Academy, okay? Our vision is for a world we connected to God. It's for a world we connected to God. Based on the hadith of, of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who said that this Islam will reach every home. There will not be a home, even if it's a home made out of mud or hair, except Islam will reach it. So Sheikh Abdurrahim Green, our chairman and founder, he set up this organization 11 years ago. And Alhamdulillah, until now, we are continuously sharing the message of Islam compassionately and intelligently to the non-Muslim. So we're mainly focusing on sharing Islam to the non-Muslim. So I'm going to show you a small video of what some of the activities that we do across the globe, inshallah. Many people say that doing something you love is always going to be a piece of cake. However, what I've realized is that when Allah blesses something, you can have your cake and eat it. I am so proud to be part of an organization which is dedicated to conveying the call by advancing the prophetic mission, which is reconnecting humanity to Allah all around the world. We've just completed the first six months of our operational year and I'm pleased to say that we now have our fingers in lots of pies. We brought on board 18 outreach specialists from across six continents who are serving the compassionate message of Islam across the world. In the last six months we have delivered outreach training, lectures, community events and engaged with our stakeholders in over 25 countries. Some of these include Taiwan, India and the Philippines. In the last six months we achieved what we did in the whole of last year. Do not take this with a pinch of salt. We are committed to this noble cause. Globally, it hasn't been the best time to be a Muslim. However, there is no point crying over spilt milk. We truly believe in positively engaging with our brothers and sisters in humanity by sharing Islam. The only way forward is to positively engage, elevate and educate. This is why I'm delighted to tell you that our impact is now felt in over 140 countries. These countries have been directly impacted by our materials, activities and publications. At home in the UK, we delivered two transformative retreats, educating and empowering new Muslims to positively contribute to society. Supporting new Muslims hasn't always been everyone's bread and butter. That's why I'm so proud that we've empowered over 2,000 new Muslims since July. We also developed and trained leading Imams, educators and influentials. As they participated in our educational program, they acquired a holistic understanding of how to share Islam. Our educational intensives are already bearing fruit. What's my line anyway? Nothing cheesy, I hope. In conclusion, the biggest highlights for me were the official launch of Masjid Hana in Malawi where we had 86 Shahadas and the 215 Filipino villagers becoming Muslim. Our focus is not just people hearing the message of Islam, we are committed to the development of new Muslims. For example, our full-time Imam at Masjid Hanna is currently using the facilities to develop the new Muslims to positively engage with the community and share the beautiful message of Islam. We want to ensure we have no bad apples in our communities. We are taking this responsibility seriously. May Allah reward you for supporting us. Okay, Alhamdulillah, that, that video was a video that we made three years ago in order to showcase the work that we have been doing. But since then, Alhamdulillah, we, as mentioned, we are in six continents, such as Europe, uh, Latin America, North America, uh, in Oceania, Asia, and in Africa. And Alhamdulillah, in Africa, we are in 11 countries, such as Botswana, Burundi, Ghana, Ghana, Malawi, Namibia, Nigeria, Uganda, Rwanda, Tanzania, and South Africa. What we do is we focus in on calling non-Muslim to Islam. So in 2018, our financial year is basically from July to June. In 2018, 2019, we were only in two countries. We only have seven du'at. Du'at are uh, personnel that we hire who solely focuses on calling non-Muslim to Islam. We train them, we develop them, 
and we get them to support the new Muslim. We've got about 781 shahadas and we're supporting 436 new Muslim. And remember, 90% of our work is supporting new Muslim and that is the foundation that allows us to continue to grow. 2019, 2020, eight countries, 17 du'at, 1,856 shahadas, 1,651 new Muslim supported. July 2020 to 2021, 11 countries, 114 du'at, 5,999 shahadas, 5,693 shahadas. Can you see the growth? Can you all see the growth? Okay, you can see the shahada from 700 to 1,800 to 5,999. And this is Africa alone. Brothers and sisters, I want you all to take a guess. I'm going to show you the next slide. And the next slide will show you how many shahadas we got last year. Who can take a guess? Give me a number. Last year, uh, 2020, 2021, is 5,900. How many do you think this last year? Huh? 8,000? Okay. Uh, give me another number. Huh? 50,000? Allahu Akbar, you're very ambitious. Allahu Akbar. Huh? One more. One more number. Who can get it? <laughs> I like that. <laughs> MashaAllah. Guess who is the closest? 339,415 shahada. Takbir. Brothers and sisters, we jumped from 5,999 to 39,415 shahadas in Africa alone. Now you all must be wondering, how did you do this? What have we done to achieve such number? We'll go through that, inshallah. Okay? And we supported about 29,996 shahadas. Okay? One of the biggest reasons we did this is because we are having du'at. We, were, we only had 114 du'at. We increased to 316 in Africa alone. So we grow very rapidly. In Malawi, we had only a small operation. Now we have 150 du'at. In Tanzania, we had a small operation. Now we have 100 du'at. In Uganda, 44 du'at. In Rwanda, 20 du'at. And these du'at, with a system, with a structure in place, it, it allows us to grow very fast and very rapidly. Alhamdulillah, across the world, we got 50,000 shahadas. What does that mean? 90% of shahadas came from Africa. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa Our beloved brother, Ustaz Adnan, just came into the room for those who are online. And hopefully he'll be giving a reminder uh, once I complete this presentation. So if 50,000 shahadas we got across the globe, 40,000 is only in Africa alone, brothers and sisters. What does that show? shows that people in Africa are ready to become Muslim. People in Africa are ready to become Muslim. It's just a matter of us waking up and sharing the message of Islam to them. Let me show you a video, inshallah. This is in Malawi, by the way. <laughs> Yesu amapembeza kugosa ngope yake pasi Ndiye iferero lino Jipembeza Osa fanana ndi Yesu Mkumaimba nyimbo ija Sikukiri sana What would happen if you put an elephant On a motorbike Nanda jika 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 jika
Sienda. Oh, oh. Okay. So I want to ask you this question. If you can't fit an elephant on a motorbike, you can't fit a mountain on a motorbike. How does it make sense to say that Molungu fitted inside a man? So as I got older and older, so you know, I understood that this religion cannot be true. So There is only one way to paradise. By following the prophets. Who wants to follow the prophet? Put your hands up. Who wants to follow the prophet? Who wants to follow the prophet? Ashadu An La Ilaha Illallah Wa Ashadu Anna Muhammadan Rasulullah So brothers and sisters in Islam, as you can see the da'wah work that we are doing. And when we are doing da'wah, alhamdulillah, I'm going to give you an extraction example of how we do da'wah. We go to a country, we hire a team. We have a structure, a top management team, a country manager, a finance officer, an administrator, the whole organizational structure. Then we hire du'at. We send two du'at in a village. Are these foreign du'at? Are these from different countries? No, we hire from the local people to give down to their own people because that was the sunnah of the Quran, calling people to their own people. So they go to the village, they call their people to Islam. They took, they take the shahada, they become Muslim. What do you do? These two du'at have to stay in that village for a month or two or three to teach the new Muslim, the basic foundation of Islam. How to read Surah Al-Fatiha, how to read Surah Al-Ikhlas, who is Allah, how to make wudu. And during the new Muslim class, non-Muslim attend. They continue to learn about Islam and also take their shahada. With that structure, alhamdulillah, we're able to do go far and wide. So we have one to three month village new Muslim camp. We have weekly classes in the city. And uh, also we have two week retreats that we're doing. And we also have six month new Muslim imam program where we take new Muslim to a masjid or an area where we focus on developing the basic foundation of Islam. You can see our structure that we have. We have a country manager, we have an administrator, and then we have regional offices that focus in a particular district, in a particular area. We don't do random da'wah. We do our homework, we do our research, we strategize, we plan. We take out the map of Tanzania or Malawi. We break it into sections. We look where our stakeholders are. We build relationship with stakeholders in order to support us in doing da'wah. We don't do humanitarian work, we don't build massages, we don't build boho. We are focusing on the prophetic mission of calling people to La ilaha illallah Muhammad al-Rasulullah. And you can see also our structure on a monthly basis mm -hmm. of the team. They're communicating with, with, with the support officer or the structure. They're reporting every day. We even have an app, an app, a phone app where PIM reports their shahadas, the new Muslim, the register on the app, so that we at the HQ get an overview of what is happening across the globe, specifically for Africa, for us, 
and then we can plan and strategize in order to continue to share the message of Islam. As you all know, brothers and sisters, this is a legacy diagram. You want to change society. You want to bring goodness in this world. The only way to do it is to call people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when you make an impact in your da'wah and people become Muslim and they develop to become a, a active member of the society as a new Muslim, that brings goodness to the fam family and neighborhood, that brings goodness to the district and the community, to the clan and tribe, and to the nation and society. Brothers and sisters, three days ago, I was in Johannesburg and I was staying in Greenside. Now, I know through many people saying, you know, South Africa, it, 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 it's a very scary place to be. There's a high crime rate, you know, be careful wherever you go. Now, when I went to Greenside, I was staying at the house of a revert sister. And I asked the sister, is this place safe? You know what she said to me? She said, yes, because this is a Muslim area. Doesn't that make you proud? Doesn't make you proud to be part of this? This is a safe area. She's a reverse sister. This is a safe area because it is a Muslim area. And I not... I didn't only hear from her, but I heard from other people in Pretoria and other places. Wherever there is Muslim, the people feel there are peace because the Muslims are there to protect them and to help them, whatever that may be. So only through Islam, brothers and sisters, you can remove corruption in, uh, on earth. You can bring goodness and, of course, build our akhirah. Okay? And of course, as an organization, we're always piloting activities, piloting projects, how we can be more, more most impactful with the limited cost with extra benefit. For example, we did some pilots for providing rice porridge in the morning in the class. With that data, we can collect how many people are attending, how many people are not attending. Is that a good pilot? For example, we did biscuits and juice. We provided biscuits and juice in the villages instead of providing food. We sent couples, for example. We hired husband and wife to go to the village and see how they can do Dao together. We are always we have a tea a meeting, a monthly meeting with the global team. Every all du'at of Aira in six continents, we have once a month meeting where we share good practice, we share good ideas, we come up with ideas of how to continue the prophetic mission of Islam. This is the final video I want to show you a, an amazing story, one of the case studies that we have that has happened in Taking Australia. Shahada, closing her pub and starting a halal business. This is a story you don't want to miss. Our team visited a village in Tanzania to give dawah and she was one of the many people who decided to take Shahada. Straight after that, she approached one of the brothers and said, you guys said alcohol is haram, but that's my business. What should I do? The team did Shura, gathered some money and said, we will help you start a new business. She decided to start selling donuts and something crazy happened. So we decided to visit and see it for ourselves. When we met the sister again, she could fully recite the Fatiha in Arabic, mashallah. This is the beauty of Aira's classes. Her recipe is simple. She prepares the dough, cuts them up, gets the oil boiling, dips them in, and fries them on both sides until they are brown and crispy and serves them hot. Absolutely amazing, delicious, especially because the sister made them with a lot of love, with a lot of compassion for us. They were so tasty and have become so popular now that she sells 200 a day sometimes. <laughs> This is just one of the many Shahada I era gets around the world. Imagine giving 20 pounds a month, 
which is just $26 a month, you would be part of 100 Shahadas per day. And not just that, the new Muslim support we provide, like in the case of this sister. Isinge kuwa watu kama hao, kama nyinyi, mnazunguka vijini na kulingania hii dini ya uislamu, watu wa... I wanted to pause that part. If it wasn't for people spreading Islam, I would not have known about it. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, in ladhi hadana li hadha wa ma kunna li nahtadiya lawla an hadana Allah. All praises due to Allah who have guided us to this and if it wasn't for him, he would not have been guided. Brothers and sisters, when you see this picture, what is your initial thoughts? This person is lost. This person is misguided. This person is a shaitan. This person is alone. This person is depressed, whatever it may be. Brothers and sisters, if we do not approach individuals like this, they will continue to be lost. But because someone approached him, someone called him to Islam, they transformed their life. You all have a chance, one way or another, to be part of this transformation. Without further ado, I'd like to invite our guest speaker, who is a historian, who has a master's degree from the University of London in history. He specialized in Islamic civilization, comparative religion and Hadith literature. He's been doing Da'wah for the past 20 years. It has been an honor. Brothers and sisters, it has been an honor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me the opportunity to work with him. Not only have I benefited from his knowledge and his wisdom, but also from his kindness and hard work and sacrifice that he's doing for the sake of Da'wah. Brothers and sisters, I'd like to invite Ustad Adnan Rashid. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala khatam al-anbiya wa sayyid al-mursaleen wa ala alihi wa ashabihi al-ghur al-mayameen wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsanin ila yawm al-deen amma ba'd. Brothers and sisters, I am honored to be here once again. This is a very special place where I stand right now. This is the place where foundations for the movement of Dawah were laid. And you may be thinking, what am I talking about? I believe Sheikh Ahmad Didat, Rahmatullahi alayhi, moved this Ummah to this level of da'wah where we are today. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses a person who has passion for Islam, who has passion for da'wah, to do great things. Things scholars of Islam may not be able to do. Knowledge does not always necessitate action. And in fact, the scholars of Islam have said that knowledge is what you act upon. The rest is information. The rest is information. So if you don't act upon your knowledge, then it is actually not knowledge. So this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes uses people who are, who are least likely to do something great like that. Sheikh Ahmad Didat, if you know his story, he was a fifth grader. He was not a highly qualified PhD doctor or someone who went to university to study theology or comparative religion. He was someone who was passionate for Islam. He wanted to defend Islam. You all know his story. I'm pretty sure you do. But why am I mentioning him? Because what Ayero is doing today and the people involved in this organization are directly inspired by Sheikh Ahmad Didat's example. 
and I can tell you that I had conversations, personal conversations with the chairman of this organization, Abdurrahim Green. He has told me personally that he's to watch Sheikh Ahmad Didat's videos and feel the drive, the passion to get involved in Dawah. And he started to go to Speaker's Corner in London. And there he started to do Dawah. And only Allah knows how many people came to Islam through his Dawah. Once I was on a TV appeal and a sister called in. She said, I'm an English revert. And I accepted Islam because I was passing through the park, Hyde Park, London, and I saw this man preaching. And his name is Abdurrahim Green. I heard his words, Islam entered my heart, and I left the park. Later on, I accepted Islam. Now I have six children, and all of them are memorizing the Quran. This is one example. So he doesn't even know. Green doesn't know. So imagine on the Day of Judgment, Green will get the shock of his life and he sees droves upon droves behind him, listening to him or due to his work, due to his... what This organization is his brainchild. He's the one who had the sincerity and the passion to start this process. He realized that Muslim Ummah in general, collectively, we have failed to deliver the message of Islam as it should be delivered. There are individuals who are doing it. They are very fortunate, very, very fortunate people. They are doing it. But collectively, we don't see the effort. How do we know this? You will find Muslim generals, Muslim kings, Muslim presidents, Muslim tycoons, Muslim basketball players, Muslim footballers, you know, big famous guys with a lot of influence and power and money. And for some reason, that power, influence and money does not translate into calling people to Allah. Brother Adil was saying that the Africans are ready. The Africans are ready to accept Islam. <laughs> Let me tell you, Africans were ready 1,400 years ago. We are late. Africans were ready long time ago to accept Islam. We came late. There was a man in Botswana, 90 years old. When our du'at, they went to give da'wah, he said, you're 90 years late. You're 90 years late. If you came to me earlier, I would accept this team. Where were you? Why did it take you so long to reach us? Wallahi, there are people here in this country, in the rural areas, you take Islam to them, they will accept. We are guilty. And the first step to improvement, to progress, is to accept your fault. We must accept that we have failed the world to convey the message of Islam collectively. I'm not talking about individuals. We have noble characters like Sheikh Ahmad Didat and other du'at around the world. You know, Sheikh Ahmed, he, what he did was very, very important. He set a precedent. He drove passion through the veins of this ummah. He showed the ummah that we can defend Islam. You don't have to be, as he used to put it, a didad or didi, right, to do this. Just pick up books. Start reading and have the confidence to reach people and you will see people accept. So he drove this confidence through people and people watched his videos, his debates, his conversations, his talks. He used to sit in there in that office and he had cameras filming every single conversation he was having with... Uh, I have seen those conversations myself in London long before I came here. Long before I came here, and when I came here, I was very emotional looking at that very chair, those old, big, giant cameras, and those chairs in front of the table where people, you know, all these missionaries to come and sit and talk to the sheikh. 
So he drove this passion and confidence through the ummah that you can do it. You just need to rise. You just need to do it. Otherwise, history will not forgive you. History will not forgive you. We are Muslims because of sacrifices of certain people from the past. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa what did he come for? We the Muslims collectively have almost mastered everything. We have almost mastered everything except, collectively speaking, except what the prophets were sent for. What did they come for? They came to call the world to Islam, to Allah. To call the world to Allah. The last revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Quran, the final message to mankind, 40% of it is about the stories of the prophets. So what is Allah telling us? How they prayed, where they placed their hands, how they made wudu, we don't find any of that. We don't find those details. How Nuh salam prayed to Allah. His salah, we don't have the details. How Isa salam fasted, we don't have the details. How Ibrahim salam worshipped in the Kaaba, we don't have the details. What we do know, how they gave da'wah. And who they gave da'wah to. And why they were giving da'wah. We know these things from the Quran. That's why Allah is telling these stories. So the most important people to walk the planet were the prophets of Allah. They were not business tycoons. They were not generals. Unless they were serving the cause of Allah. They were not kings necessarily. Unless they were people of Allah. As far as Allah is concerned, the most important people to walk the planet ever were the prophets of Allah. Why? Why? Because they were calling to Allah. They were the most loyal slaves of Allah. They were the most loyal. How do we know they were loyal? Because all their lives were dedicated to one cause. And that was calling people to Allah. And if you're not doing that, your loyalty... Your loyalty may be misplaced. Islam is based upon five and those are the basics. Every Muslim must do those five things. But then there is Ihsan. Coming close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The best people are those who do da'wah. This is what Allah says in the Quran. وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ And then Allah tells us how they did da'wah. Nuh alayhi salam. Allah tells us he was giving da'wah to his people day and night. قَالَ دَا إِنِّي دَعَوْتُ قَوْمِ لَيْلًا وَنَهَارًا Oh Allah, I invited my people to you day and night. Privately, publicly. Loudly, silently. Why is Allah telling you all of this? Why is Allah telling you what modes of communication were used by Nuh alayhi salam? Why? So that you realize how dedicated he was and how important the work is, what he was doing. 900 years calling people to Allah. Allah doesn't mention his occupation. Allah doesn't mention how much food he used to eat. Allah doesn't mention where he was getting his food from. None of those details. All Allah cares about is his da'wah. Similarly, move forward to Ibrahim alayhi salam. Same thing. We don't have any details of his living, his clothing, and his other details. Move forward to Musa alayhi salam. What is important to Allah is what he did in his later life, not when he was the prince of Egypt, not when he was living in the palace, and living in the palace with Fir'aun, you can only imagine what was happening there, right? Allah doesn't care about that. Allah cares about when he switched to become Musa, 
and then he did what he did. Isa alayhi salam, all Allah cares about is what he did with the Banu Israel, calling them to Allah. Likewise, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi sallam, the entire mission of his life, the mission of his life was calling people to Allah. To the extent that his entire family was put to risk. His wife, Khadija, died because of the boycott. He himself was brutalized. He was dragged within the Kaaba. Uqba bin Abi Mu'eed, la'anatullahi alayhi, came and strangled the Prophet sallallahu almost to death. And why? Imagine why. Now, why is this happening? Is this a property dispute? Is this a personal grudge? Is this someone messing with someone else's woman? Why do people fight? Money? What was it? No. Abu Bakr comes running to rescue him. What does he say? Attaqtuluna rajulan. An yaqula rabbi Allah. Are you going to kill a man because he says Allah is my Rabb? Is, that, is this why you're going to kill him? That was the problem. The issue was that. They put intestines on him. Why? The Prophet was bleeding up to his toe. Up to his toes. He was in blood. Why? On the day of Taif. Why? La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. Calling people. Knocking doors. Can you imagine? He went to the chiefs in the city of Taif. And he said to the chiefs, don't get involved. Don't get involved. You don't want to believe? No problem. Your choice. Don't let your people die in kufr. Don't cause them to die in disbelief. Leave me to them. And for 10 days, almost 10 days, every single door. Can you imagine Rasulullah sallallahu knocking doors? Come to Allah. Come to Allah. Come to Allah. And we know all of this. The, the amazing thing is we, the Muslims, collectively from Morocco to Bangladesh, we know this. We read about it. We read the Quran. And yet, we are not doing the work he was doing. And I'm not talking about Muslims giving da'wah to Muslims. I'm not talking about that. You may start giving me examples of Muslims going around Mus the Muslim world, staying in the masajid and doing islah of the Muslims, which is a beautiful thing. Very important work. But it is not da'wah. It is islah. It is correction. It is making people a better people. Da'wah, when Allah says da'wah in the Quran, go and check every single verse where Allah mentions the term da'wah. It means to call people to Allah. Call disbelievers to Allah. Calling disbelievers to Allah. Okay? So da'wah is calling disbelievers. This is something we have neglected severely, criminally. And this is why Africa is what it is. Sub-Saharan Africa was not Christian. Was not Christian. 100 years ago. These people were not Christian. If anything, Islam was there way before these colonial powers turned up. The east coast of Africa was all Muslim. Kenya, Tanzania, Mozambique, Malawi was a majority Muslim country. 100 years ago, Malawi was a Muslim nation. Now Malawi is 80% Christian. How did that happen? How did that happen? Because we neglected our responsibilities. So, just as the Sahaba gave their lives, they fought the Romans and the Persians, they were not fighting for land, they were not fighting for money, they were not money hungry, okay? They were fighting for the message of Islam. When the Persian general questioned the Muslim negotiator, 
ربيع بن عامر who was you know looking scruffy very rough came from the desert these lavish persians imagine if some muslim from uh, a village uh, walks in to a party in new york or las vegas let's say yeah where all these people wearing designer clothes with flashy cars and all their money and everything a muslim walks in with his uh, with with his lungi right as if he came from the field what what, what do you think they will think of him think, who is was this guy shouldn't be here in all between us civilized people this is how the persian when they saw ribi bin amir they were thinking these people they're going to fight us they're going to fight us so they asked rustam mocking the 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 sahabi why are you here you want camels and goats take them and get lost go he said no 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 this time is not camels and goats <laughs> this time is not that reason that the arabs are raiding your territory this time it is to remove you from the way you you are an obstacle it is for your people to worship the creator instead of worshiping man you want them to worship you we want them to worship allah this is why we are here that's the reason why we are fighting you you are the obstacle so even the jihad of the sahaba they struggle okay was not to gain land not not to earn money not to become rich it was to bring islam to these people not to force them but to let them see what islam looks like and feels like in reality to see the justice of islam to see the muslims how they live and how upright they are all these things and what happened allahu akbar from spain to china people started to accept islam not on the tip of the sword not on you know gun point no they did it they saw the muslims they assessed islam and they decided to accept this faith now imagine they did the job they did the job and they went we don't know where they died and how do we know this was the most important thing they were out to do what drove them out of their homes it's a very important question i'm asking you we all collectively run from all these countries to mecca yes or no everyone wants to take flights and go for umrah and hajj yes or no if you have iman if you love allah and his messenger you want to do that right yeah they were running away from it the sahaba they were running away from the kaaba and masjid an nabawi knowing well that one prayer in the kaaba in masjid al haram is equivalent to 100000 prayers and in masjid an nabawi it is equivalent to 1000 prayers and yet they leave arabia knowing well you know if they were as pious as we are clearly they were not as pious as we are clearly right they were not as pious as we are we are so pious that we burn money to go there even though we have done hajj which is fard upon us once we have done it we go for the second the third the fourth the designer hajj seven star hajj okay uh we do gucci hajj or uh, louis vuitton hajj and uh, and you know all these designer hajj packages people nowadays mashallah but think what you're doing with the money it's very important second hajj third hajj is nafal it is not fard anymore it is not obligatory so these sahaba why were they leaving arabia for other lands is the question and i want to address that very quickly the reason was the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam took a pledge from them the last sermon delivered by the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in front of the largest gathering of his companions to date never before and never after such a huge number of his companions will get together in one place over 100000 of them 
from all over Arabia and beyond. They're there. And he's talking to them. So this is one of the most important moments of his life. Why? Because this is where, you know, imagine you have peak time. You know, uh, you want to speak to the Americans. You are given a chance to speak to Oprah Winfrey on, on her show. Imagine that. You know, Sheikh Ahmad Didat, remember? He used to say, give me one, how, how long? One hour on BBC. Peak time. Huh? Why was he saying that? I ask you, Sheikh Ahmad Didat, everyone who listened to him knows this. He used to say, give me, I'll give you $50,000. In the 80s and 90s he was saying this. In the 80s, if I remember correctly. I'll give you $50,000. Give me some time on BBC peak time. Prime time. What we call the prime time. Why? Because he wants to talk to the nation. Because he knows that's when people will be listening. So this is the time Rasulullah this is prime time. Over a hundred thousand companions in front of him. Prime time. Time to deliver the most important message. And what does he tell them? What task does he give, give them? First he asks them, Hal ballaghtu? Have I delivered? You people listening to me, have I delivered? So they say, yes, Ya Rasulullah, you have delivered. You have delivered the message to us. We have received it. Now, you have received it. Take it to those who are absent, who are not here. And when they heard these words, they didn't make excuses. They had families, they had children. Some were thin, some were not so thin, some were tall, some were short, some were old, some were young, all sorts of people, men, women, all sorts of people. When they heard these words, they took them very seriously. And how do we know that over 90% of them died outside of Arabia? Over 90% of them. We have very few who were buried in Medina and Makkah. Very few. Al-Baqi didn't have more than a few thousand Sahaba, one or two or three thousand Sahaba maybe, at max, buried in Al-Baqi. What happened to the rest? I am asking you a question. What happened to the rest? Where did they go? Where did they go? And why? They are buried on the borders of Pakistan. They are buried in Afghanistan, in Persia, in Central Asia, in Turkey, current day Turkey. They are buried in North Africa. And their students went as far as France. In the first century, the late first century of Islam, it wasn't 100 years since the Prophet had died, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and they were in France. In the year 92, the Prophet died in the year 11, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the year 92, exactly 81 years later, the Muslims were in northern China. And they landed in Spain. And they landed in Sindh, in current day Pakistan. In that very year, 92. Remember the year 92. Why? And then they're doing da'wah. They're calling people to Islam. They're telling people about Allah and His Messenger. Okay? And that's why so many people accepted Islam in droves, in hundreds of thousands, because of the sacrifices. Now, and, and amazingly, no mobile phones, no laptops, no jets, no money, no proper clothes, no weapons, no rights. They walked. While they walked, they died. Many of them died walking. By the way, we don't know most of them where they buried. We, we have no idea where most of the Sahaba of Rasulullah are buried. Only Allah knows and they know. We don't know where they were. We don't know where they died. They went out. They took the message of Islam out. So we have all of this. We have all the books in the world, in our libraries. We have cars, we have mobile phones, we have laptops. Most importantly, we have money. And yet, we are not achieved, we, we haven't achieved even 10% of what they did. So what, what is so different between us and them? Our reading of the Quran, the same Quran they were reading, our reading is different to theirs. They read it, they did something. We are reading it and it's not happening. The reason is realization. History will not forgive us. 
if we fail today to take the message of Islam to the world, history will not forgive us. You will not only lose your children to kufr, you will get all these millions of people to blame you on the Day of Judgment. That these Indian Muslims from India, they came to us, they lived with us for 150 years, and they didn't tell us anything about their faith. They didn't tell us anything. They went to Botswana, they went to Zambia, they went to Malawi, they were in Mozambique. They didn't tell us anything. You know Yemenis, why they are so special? Yemenis, wherever they went, they took Islam with them. The Malay people, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, even Thailand. You know how Islam got there? No army went there. No one went conquering. And yet, we have millions of Muslims there. How? How did, how did the west coast of India become Muslim? Yemeni traders. How did the east coast of Africa become Muslim? Yemeni traders. So my brothers, we remember them. Allah remembers them. There was a man, one man who went to Uganda. There was only one Yemeni man who went to Uganda. One Yemeni man. And he's remembered in history, Sheikh Ahmed. Okay? He went to Uganda. And today we have millions of Muslims in Uganda. One man. Likewise, Sheikh Uthman Danfodio in West Africa. Nigeria, Niger, and parts of Ghana. How did Islam come to these territories? Because of these sheikhs and their efforts. Okay, Islam is dynamic. It spreads itself. You just need to open your mouths. You just need to be there to support the work. And if you're not part of Dawa, if you're not part of Dawa, especially, especially when you are living with non-Muslims, then you have to question your Iman. You have to question yourself on the Musalla when you stand and pray Salah. What do you mean, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen? Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Malik Yom. What do you mean by all these things? When you say Allahu Akbar, what do you mean Allahu Akbar? It's going to be thrown back at you. Allah, Allahu Akbar just for you? For one person? Or one family? What about Allahu Akbar on the street? What about Allahu Akbar for the villages and the rural areas here? So brothers, we are facing a very dire situation, you know. Life is short. COVID has taught us, you know, you can lose people in one strike. You, you're with people today, in a week, they're dead, they're gone. And beyond COVID, you're in Durban, so I know what happened here. Uh, has it been a year since the riots? Yes. Huh? Has it been a year? What did you learn from those riots? Why were these riots happening? And why were the Muslims being targeted? This was a lesson from Allah for you to wake up. Wake up! Because if you will not give dawah to people out there, Kufr will get to you. Because if Kufr overpowers a society, Kufr means fasad, injustice. It means chaos. It means destruction. And this is what happened, right? And if you do not bring Islam to these people, you will be the first victims. Just like that man in that town who did not do Amr bil Ma'roof wa Nahi Anil Munkar, he was rolling his tasbih in his house. You know the hadith. You know the hadith, right? He was rolling his tasbih in the house. Very pious man. Very clean and very dedicated to Allah. His Islam was personal. It was inside his house. But on the streets of that town, there was facade. There was fitna, destruction. So Allah sends angels to destroy, destroy this town. Hold on, Ya Allah, there is that slave of you, there is that man who loves you, who prays to you, who is praying non-stop. What does Allah tell him or tell them? What does Allah tell them according to the hadith? You tell me. Huh? 
start with him start with him subhanallah start with him why because he is the reason why the society is like that allah blessed him with hidayah allah blessed him with islam and he did not take it to people start with him so what do you think we are special here in south africa or in britain or in canada and australia or anywhere in the world in india look what's happening look what's happening in india what goes around comes around dawa is life dawa is survival dawa is your progress dawa is your achievement if there is no dawa if you're not calling people to allah you will forget not only yourselves your children will abandon this deen and if it will not remain in your generations and if you stick to dawa if you walk in the path of allah even those dust particles that touch your feet allah will because of those dust particles save you and your your future generations this is on the quran in surah al kahf allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the story of khadr and musa yeah khadr alayhi salam starts to build this wall I want you to pay attention. Something you may not have contemplated before. This is a lesson from the Quran. Hadar starts to build this wall in this bad town. The town is bad. These people are bad people. They were very crude and harsh with the, these these guests. Musa alayhi salam cannot take it. Why are you helping these people? Look what they did to us. So Hadar later on when he explains that under that wall was a treasure that belonged to two orphans yes two orphans so allah uses khadr commands khadr to build a wall on top of that treasure so the treasure is protected for the orphans in this bad town these two orphans they must be special these two kids must be special you know why why are they special allah is using one wali Khadr, if he was not a prophet of Allah, he was definitely one of the awliya of Allah. Why? Because he is teaching lessons to Musa alayhi salam. No ordinary person can be teaching a rasul of Allah uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So one wali is building the wall like a laborer, lifting bricks, putting mud, building, working for who? Working for those two orphans. Yeah? Look how special these two orphans are. And then on top of that, a messenger of allah is also building this wall for them and then there is a prophet of allah with them yusha ibn nun the young man with musa alayhi salam who became a prophet later on he is also involved so allah is using one wali and two prophets and one rasul right to build this wall for these two orphans who are these two orphans they must be very special khadr explains wa kana abuhuma saliha their father was a good man he was beloved to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so to protect one of the beloved of allah allah uses a prophet a rasul and a wali to build a wall for his children out of allah's courtesy so if you think if you will not if you will sacrifice for allah whatever you can walking talking your physical your financial health whatever you might do right you think it's going to go to waste absolutely not never never allah will not never waste your good deeds never waste for what what, uh, what you do for him so my brothers and sisters finally i will end here history will not forgive us these people will not forgive us on the day of judgment the south africans the malawians allah sent us here for a purpose there's a plan initially we thought we are here for better economic prospects we are here to make a better life we are economic immigrants right but that that's not the plan of allah allah put you here in these lands so that you can show them islam you can show them islam and if you fail to show them islam then you deserve nothing less than what happened during the riots collectively if we don't share islam with these people then that was just a teaser are you listening to me brothers and sisters that was just a teaser what may come in the future you may not be able to handle it read the history of islam what read what happened in spain 
You are nothing like Spanish Muslims. Read about them, what they were. They were very powerful. They had armies. They had caliphs. And they got wiped out completely. Completely wiped out from that peninsula. We need to learn. Otherwise, history will not forgive us. So here ends my short reminder. Moving on to the point. How can we do this? How can we actually get involved in that? Well, most importantly, we want your personal dedication. We want you to be personally involved. Here you have this blessing, IPCI, the legacy of Sheikh Ahmad Didat. This is where this global dawah started, by the way. The 20th century dawah revolution started here. You may not know this. It started here by this one man, our Saudi ulama, our Indian ulama, our Egyptian ulama, our Indonesian ulama, our Moroccan ulama did not do what Sheikh Ahmed was used to do. Allah used this one man to do what our ulama collectively could not do. Allah used him to confront the disbelievers intellectually and defeat them in debates and show the world that Islam is a power. Intellectually, Islam cannot be defeated. Scripturally, Islam cannot be defeated. Our scripture is so powerful. It's a, your, with your PhDs, with your big money, with your big countries, with your big you know, military arsenals, you have nothing because your religion is false. Your religion is false. And our religion is true. This is Sheikh Ahmad Didat. And it started here, here, 20th century Dawah revolution started here. Wallahi, it saddens me when I see South Africa, the country of Sheikh Ahmad Idad, Islam is still very limited. Our masjids will not talk to people. I mean, they are monuments, but they will not go and speak to people and, and explain Islam to them. You will have to talk to them. You have to talk to the, the tribes there, Zulus and others. Uh, big, big tribes here of the natives, the locals. Speak to them. Tell them about Islam. Tell them, share Islam with them. And you see they will become your strength. They will become your strength. So we need to abandon this attitude we have all over Southern Africa, not only South Africa. All over, I have been to most of these countries. I've been to mo almost every single country except Zimbabwe. Okay. Uh, all of these countries, same problem. For some reason, we have the confidence to make money, to establish businesses, to drive these flashy, fat cars, Range Rovers driving around African roads. Yeah, we all, we all, we all manage to do this. For some reason, we don't get the confidence to give it. live for Dawa and die for Dawa. That was that is the purpose of your life. Do your business so that you can work for dawa. Don't do it so that you can go and have a holiday once a year, okay, and live a miserable life and leave behind your wealth for your children to fight and die over it. What's going to happen? You don't do dawa, you make a lot of money, you build these big, big businesses, you leave millions of dollars behind, you die, what happens? Your children fight. And then they blow it in two years. When they get the shares, they blow it in two years. What comes easy? Goes easy. They haven't worked for it. Easy come, easy go, as they say. Or what comes around, it goes around. So the money you have not spent for dawah, it's wasted. If you earn money just to live a happy life, there's nothing wrong with that. Go and have swimming pools in your houses. Drive these flashy cars. But if you're not doing dawah, if you're not indulging in dawah, all of this is going to be a lock on the day of judgment in your neck. So on, the, on that note, getting to the, the point, we are here today to ask you to support our work. It is Africa-wide. We're not stopping. We have a vision for the next 50 years. Our vision is that by the year 2070, okay, by the year 2070, Islam will enter every house in sub-Saharan Africa. Inshallah. Inshallah. And we're not stopping. We're not stopping. Whether you are with us or not, doesn't matter to us. All we need is Allah. We don't need people. 
but we are reaching out to you so that you can be part of the caravan and seek Allah's blessings through it. Okay? Because there's nothing better than this. I cannot think of anything better for a Muslim to do in his life. Okay? There is nothing better. There's nothing better. Rasulullah in different reports, he said different things. When people asked him, what is the best of Islam? He said, uh, Hajjul Mabrur, an accepted Hajj, for example. Or other things he said uh, at other times, right? But let me tell you something. Nothing is better than what the prophets came to do collectively. Da'wah, calling people to Allah. Because now, when you bring one person to Islam, you have brought generations to Islam. When these people will have children, these Malawians you see accepting Islam in droves, and Rwandis and Tanzanians, you know, these people, they will have children. And so long as they continue to pray and read the words of Allah, you will be rewarded in your grave. Even a thousand years later, those people who came to Islam or who became Muslim because of your da'wah, you will be rewarded in your grave. And there's plenty of work to do. There's plenty for everyone to take, right? There are plenty, millions of people here in South Africa and beyond, right? Every single person who prays, you will get the reward. So we are basically, you know, uh, this is what we are raising for, okay? Um, this is what we call a da'wah package. And I think Brother Adil explained how our da'wah works. Our du'at are full-time uh, um, dedicated to this. And anyone who is working full-time needs support for the family, right? So we support them. We provide that support for their families. We call it a stipend, like a fee, okay? Not for their da'wah. You cannot pay anyone for da'wah. Okay, this is like Abu Bakr radiallahu an when he became the Khalifa, he was selling in the market and Ali and Omar, they saw him. They said, what are you doing? What are you doing? He said, I need to feed my family. They said, no, no, no. The Muslims will feed your family. Go and do the job of the Khalifa. You are, an, you are a Khalifa now. You are the ruler of Muslims. If you're selling in the market to feed your family, when are you going to do the job of the ruler? So they asked him, how much do you need? He said, half a goat. They said, we will give you one goat, one complete full goat. Go and take care of the Muslim affairs, right? This is what we're trying to do with our brothers. Here in Africa, there are plenty of brothers who can do da'wah, and they're doing da'wah. And by the way, all these 50,000 shahada, shahadas we got last year are acquired by the locals, the natives. No white man came looking like Jesus from the UK to preach to the African villagers for them to suddenly wake up to Islam. No, no miracles happened. These African brothers, local brothers from Malawi, from Tanzania, from Rwanda, from South Africa, and from other countries where we are, we have teams, Botswana and Namibia, these local brothers are doing da'wah. They are calling their people to Islam. The only difference is we're taking care of their families by providing that stipend, monthly stipend for them. And this is what we need support in. The more we have, and we have calculated, in a country like Malawi, which has 28 districts, we need 50 du'at in each district for the next 20 years to take the entire country. To basically go to every single village, every single house to share the message of Islam. We worked it out. If we have 1,500 du'at in Malawi, just one country, I'm giving you an example so that you understand, right? Uh, and we split them in 28 districts. So that would be approximately 50 du'at in each district. And they would need the next 10 to 20 years to take the message of Islam in the entire district, these 50 people, right? In 20 years, all of Malawi would re receive the message of Islam. And by the rate we are going, what we are looking at right now, we believe 60 to 70 percent of the country can come back to Islam, revert back to Islam after having lost their faith to colonialism, colonialism and, and, and all the other uh, influences they, they uh, faced in the last hundred years. Just 1,500 brothers and sisters, okay? And there are 3 million in, in Malawi. 3 million Muslims in Malawi. All we need is 1,500 out of them. In the next 20 years, the message of Islam will reach every single house. Why are we doing this? The Prophet ﷺ said it, that Islam will enter every house on the back of this planet, whether that house is made of mud, 
hair or leather. Islam will enter it. In other words, the Prophet is saying it will enter every single house, whether the house is made of bricks or whether it's made of straw or it's like a hut. And this is the vision we're trying to fulfill. So those of you who want to support us, um, you might have forms on your tables. If you want to support, for example, one daya will cost us 4,167 rands. Is that what? For the year? Yeah, one month. For the year is 50,000 rand approximately. Okay. For one, so one daya will cost us for the whole year, one person giving dawah full time. On average, this, this person is bringing over 100 people to Islam every year. Over a hundred people. So one person supporting this one person is getting the reward for all of those hundred people who accept Islam in that particular year. And this is Africa wide, by the way. Okay, we are in eleven countries currently, and in the next five years, we plan to be in every single sub-Saharan country. Currently, we are in Rwanda, Burundi, Uganda, Tanzania, Ghana, Nigeria, Malawi, Zambia, Botswana, Namibia, South Africa. Okay, and we're going to go to Swaziland, Lesotho, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Madagascar, uh, inshallah, and uh, Congo, um, and then Angola, and all those countries, Sub-Saharan Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, inshallah. All of these countries will be covered eventually. We're going to be in every single one of them, right? So what you're doing is you're supporting one of these du'as. We have worked out the average, and this is what you're doing. 50,000 rand per year is supporting one of these du'as to do this job and they're not stopping. Our system is so robust and strong that every single person does the maximum. Okay, we have a monitoring system, we have a reporting system, so we know every single country, Alhamdulillah, we have a structure, uh, a, a hierarchy, uh, as Brother Adil explained earlier. So we have a very strong, powerful system. Uh, even transparency, Alhamdulillah, is all there. So uh, I don't think to my knowledge, I mean, and this is not a statement I'm making out of pride or some kind of haughtiness, but I don't think this dawa organized to this level has ever been done before in the world, in our history. I don't think so. I, I have not found any other organization. Tablighi Jamaat is the only other exception I can think of, but they don't do dawa to non-Muslims. Tablighi Jamaat as a policy does not go to non-Muslims. They have their focus. They want to reform Muslims, which is a great idea. It's a beautiful idea. But they are the only exception I can think of who are organized, very sincere, down to earth. They have a very strong system which works to this day. But anyone, any organization giving dawah to non-Muslims, to my knowledge, uh, to this level of organization, uh, it hasn't been done before unless someone can correct me and I would be more than happy to be corrected on that point inshallah Okay, and it's a global organization. We are now in six continents and it's growing. It's not stopping It's gonna go uh, bigger and bigger inshallah ta'ala And now we are reaching out to business people in each country to take care of their own country Okay, instead of depending on one pot from the headquarter we are reaching out just like we are reaching out to you today. We're reaching out to stakeholders uh, tycoons, business people, people who have a lot of money and influence, we're reaching out to them, Muslims in these countries, and telling them, take care. Some of them, they run countries. They are so rich and powerful, they run countries. So I believe South Africa alone, this country here alone, can take care of the entire project we're dealing with. I'm not exaggerating. There are Muslims in South Africa here, they are so rich, that they, only 10 or 20 of them, can take care of our entire operation for the next 20, 30 years. And we need you to reach out to them. And, you know, this is for us, it's not a money-making scheme. We're not making money out of this. Every single thing is going to this work. And alhamdulillah, we are doing our best. And new Muslims, uh, they are our focus. Our focus is new Muslims so that they are not left without any training. What happens in Africa very often, people go to villages, they take shahada, they take videos and pictures and banners are put up and a lot of hoo-ha and a lot of clapping and applause and then they disappear three, three days later. So when you go back to these villages, you ask people, Islam, they say, what Islam? What do you mean Islam? What Islam? We, we don't, they don't even know what they were doing, right? So we have to stay with them. We have to teach them. We have to be with them. 
When you look at these Christian missionaries, some of them, they give their lives. They come from America, Canada, Australia. Even now they're coming from South Korea, right? Uh, they live in these villages. They spend time with these people, and that's what we want the Muslims to do. And, and we, because we have the haq, because we have the truth, I believe there is no, nothing stopping us. Nothing stopping us. Rwanda, just to give you one example, a country. 25 years ago, uh, up to the genocide, you know, the Rwandese genocide, you know about it, 1994, a million people were killed in 100 days. Okay, I'm not going to take much of your time. I'm finishing right now. When I know we have to go to the food as well. And uh, this is something I want to share with you very quickly. This is how negligent we are. I just want you to realize how negligent we are. Rwanda, in 1994, there were 2% Muslims there. Only 2%, very small number. Very timid, marginalized, kind of on the borders kind of Muslim community. You know, 1994, the genocide happens. The Hutu and Tutsi, they kill each other. Actually, the Hutus killing the Tutsis more so, right? Because the Tutsis were in minority. Two African tribes, unfortunately, because of external uh, influences. And the church, the Catholic church was directly indicted. There are academic books written on it that the church played a direct role in the genocide. The Rwandese people know this. They know this. People were killed inside churches. People take, went to take refuge and they were killed inside. The priests got them together inside churches, telling them that we're going to protect you. And then they would go and call the killers. The killers would come and blow them up with grenades and cut them down with machetes. And Paul Kagame, the president, he ordered these churches to be uh, made into uh, memorials. And he said, Leave them. Don't clean them. Let them. The, let the world see what happened here. So you see all those little shoes and little clothes, little babies who were killed, and women and you know men, all elderly. Their bones are there. Their clothes are there. Everything. If you see what what we have seen, Wallahi, it's mind blowing. So the result was the Muslims. What did they do? Two percent. Very few people. What did they do? Every single person who came to the masjid was saved. Muslims. They saved thousands, thousands of lives. But even those who were killed Muslims are collecting their dead bodies and getting them together to bury them. So the Rwandese people saw with their own eyes what the Muslims were doing in Rwanda. They played a very positive. They did not become a party to the genocide. The outcome, now Rwanda is unofficially, sorry, officially 12%. Over a million Muslims, over a million Muslims, and unofficially Rwanda is 20% Muslim. People are accepting Islam, walking into masjids without anyone giving them dawah, without anyone talking to them. Some government dignitaries holding top positions, they read about Islam and they are becoming Muslims. In Rwanda, right now as we speak, and we have a team there of uh, 40, uh, 20, 40, 40 du'at. 40 du'at, full-time du'at right now, and we're going to expand the team. And every single day, they are getting people accepting Islam because they know that what the Catholic Church did in Rwanda and their country, they have a lot of bitterness to it. So what's the bottom line? How can you support us? If you want to support, the option is there. One da'ya will cost us 50,000 rand per year, and 10 will cost us half a million. So either you can... Support us today if you have the ability to do so. Uh, you can raise uh, your hand or you can let us know that you want to do uh, 10 du'at. Let's say if you have that money, that kind of money, half a million rands is what in pounds? Uh, it's 2,000 pounds per. Um, it's like 20,000 pounds. Yeah, 20,000 pounds is nothing. And you may be thinking, what is he talking about? 20,000 pounds is nothing? Half a million rand is nothing? I'll prove to you it's nothing. Have you been to these Indian weddings? No, no, I, I don't need to say anything, right? I don't need to say anything anymore. You go to these Pakistani and Indian weddings, yeah, when, when, when you go to this, these same people and ask them for $10 or $20, 
the response will be often, often the response will be, oh, things are tight. Things are tight. Things are tight nowadays. Come back later. You know, I, we, we, don't, we can't afford it at the moment. And then you go to their wedding. And then you see, subhanallah, you know, three Bentleys will pull up. The bride will come from a different car. The groom will come from a different Then there are two drones filming them. There's a red carpet. And only the, the stage alone, you know, the stage they will go and sit on, is probably made for $10,000 or something like that. Wallahi. Okay. And... A lot of these weddings, what happens? Because of the disobedience of Allah, the barakah is removed. The barakah is taken away from these weddings. So I'm just giving you an example. We do have money. When we want to do it, give it to Allah, give it to the, uh, to the, to the cause of the prophets, and you will see wonders happening, inshallah ta'ala, and you will not decrease in your wealth. So if anyone who wants to do it, uh, let us know how many du'at you want to support each da'ya will cost us 50,000 rands in your local currency. All over Africa, this is by the way, yeah? all over Africa, we are hiring nonstop, right? Currently, we have 300 in total. We want to go up to 3,000. We want to go up to 3,000 very soon, inshallah ta'ala, and it's going to happen. And a lot of people are supporting us, by the way. Don't think that we don't have the support. We have the support. Muslims globally are supporting us. But that doesn't mean that you keep your money and you think, okay, Muslims are doing it, so I don't need to do it. No, you need to do it because you need to be part of this movement. You need to be part of this movement. So the more we have, the bigger we will grow, and the quicker Africa, sub-Saharan Africa in particular, will receive Islam. There are those who are working on South America and Central America. Our teams are working there. It's their job. It's their business. We are responsible, myself and Brother Adil and our team, Brother Mudassar from Malawi and uh, even IPCI, we are one family. Wallahi, we always work together. Whenever we come to South Africa, even this time, Durban was almost taken out of the shed. I said, no way, we have to go to Durban. Those guys will kill me. If I don't go to Durban, those guys will kill me. So we have to go to Durban. So that's why we're here, our brothers and sisters. So I think this is all I have to say. And uh, those of you who want to support, you don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to. You want to be anonymous. But try your best to do 10, 5, 2, at least 1. And you can do it within your families, with your friends. You can get together and say, let's support Adalia. Okay? A lot of the times we send our money to India, Pakistan, uh, because we some for some reason feel more uh, closeness to our homelands, motherlands, let's say, okay? But this is the place we will be questioned about here, where we are living, Africa. Allah will question us on the Day of Judgment. What were you doing here at home where you were living, where your children grew up, where you had three, four generations and you could not reach out to these people and tell them about Islam? This is where we're going to be questioned about. So let's start doing something here, inshallah. Over to you, brother. Thank you so much. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Brother Muhammad here. Okay, questions. If anyone has questions, please go ahead. Yes. Uh, does anyone have questions? Yes, please, please be open. Yes. Wa uh, alaikum I spend quite a considerable amount of time in Malawi, Malawi, was the most affected area mm. in the of Serbia. My question to you is uh, there was a a 20-year plan put by uh, the brother in the uh, in, 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 in institution called the Ma'aisha Trust. Yes. I, I think you know... Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And he put up a, a vision hmm. in the next 20 years hmm. how he could turn the numbers back. And, and I had the opportunity of being at that meeting. And he was doing it through institutions called the Ma'aisha. Yes. The institution. So what he was like trying to do is trying to create a, a whole group of new Muslims going up front. And he felt the ones that lost deal and relied heavily on funding only, which the church was giving them, he felt there was no room for them to, to continue. And he didn't want to invest into Dawa and those areas. So he then started with this institution, Ma'aisha Trust. What's your views are about, uh, my question to you, about the Ma'aisha and the 20-year plan? The plan they have is the humanitarian plan. The plan we have, which is also uh, a 25 years plan, by the way, and uh, uh, I gave it to you slightly, I mean, uh, briefly, that 
uh, we are planning to hire at least 1,500 du'at in Malawi. Uh, my intention is to do it within the next three years. And brothers are laughing when I mentioned this. How are you going to do it? So <laughs> if the Sahaba could do it, uh, why can't we? If they could think, you know, when the Prophet ﷺ told them, you know, Allah, when he was striking the rock in the ditch, and he said to them, Allah is, you know, Allah is giving me the glad tiding of a victory over the Romans. Okay, they are in the ditch, digging a ditch to protect themselves against an army. They don't, they can't even go to the toilet without fear. And they're listening to the Prophet telling them, Allah has told us about a victory over Romans. Okay, they're listening. Then the second spark, when he strikes the rock, Allah has given me a glad tiding of a victory over the Persians and the Arabs. So not only the Arabs will be defeated, the Persians and the Romans will be defeated. These people, they, they don't even have two pieces of cloth to wear, some of them. They're so poor. But the vision, the vision of the Prophet ﷺ instilled that passion in their minds. So we like to be ambitious. So we want to hire 1,500. And the plan is within the next 25 years, all 28 districts, every single village, every single house in those villages in Malawi will receive the message of Islam. That's the plan. Now, how many thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions accept Islam? That's up to Allah. Upon us is to deliver. So my Aisha Trust and Aira are working hand in hand. Actually, we are partner organizations. We have partnered together. So what we do, we focus on Dawah. We basically get these du'at to do da'wah full time and basically give them the system to go by. Organizations like My Aisha Trust, they come in and they do the empowerment. So where new Muslims need support, where they need some medical uh, help or they need water for irrigation, My Aisha Trust comes in and they build all those things. So, so, so it's not only preaching and giving them words, it's actually trying to change their lives too. You know, so that they become more attracted to Islam, right? So we have a plan, and not only for Malawi, we have a sub-Saharan Africa plan for the continent, and then we have individuals, individual plans for each and every single country, what we, what we call a vision. We have a vision for each country. Each team has to work on a vision and give us a practical uh, way to achieve that vision. So we have that vision. Thank you for asking that question. I hope that answers you. But anyone else? Please, Sheikh, Sheikh Idris. Thank you for coming. Allah bless you. So, uh, really, uh, Allah bless you for really reminding us of uh, what our responsibilities are. And I'm reminded of a brother who built a number of masajids and I complimented him. He said to me, Idris, uh, I have only changed the geography, but I have not changed the history. Mm. This is what you, uh, all of you are doing. Really, it's a powerful message. It, uh, I listen to you with a sense of guilt. And I ask myself, what am I doing? Inshallah, I pray and hope that your your inspirational words, inshallah, will impact on all of us. Inshallah. Inshallah. Jazakallah, and thank you so much. I was looking forward to seeing you as well. Peace. Um, <clears throat> Alhamdulillah, I'm doing the vision and on the work that you guys are doing. Um, <clears throat> we come out from a from a city called Chatsworth, which is highly populated in England and Phoenix. And what we've seen there is that a lot of our Muslims are reverting into Christianity mm -hmm. and they're becoming pastors. You know, and I don't want to mention the names, but we know a lot of them that goes on to uh, television and radio, you know, proclaiming they were Muslims and now they back, uh, they are Christians. And we have a lot of Hindus in this place that we live in that reverting to Islam. Mm. But what we feel, and I speak for myself, mm. I'm, I'm four years reverted into Islam and I come from a highly pastoral position in right. the church. I okay. came from that wow. And <clears throat> what we're finding is that myself, that Islam was very hard to come by. Mm. You know what I'm saying? It was always kept to itself. Mm. And you know, Alhamdulillah, through a friend of mine, I, I got a copy of the Quran and I started to read. But the work that you guys are doing in Malawi and the sub Saharan countries is excellent. MashaAllah. But what I feel, you know, I don't know. You know, if you guys could actually think of cities like Chatsworth and Phoenix right here where we are, because 
Yes. There's hardly people doing DAO work. And, and even if they're doing it, it's like IPCI on a Friday or Saturday, you know, giving out pamphlets at a, at a ball. Mm. So I think with the intensity that you guys are doing, it would, you know, it's something to consider that it would really, really cause an impact right here where we are. You know, not forgetting Malawi and all the others, but maybe, you know, in your books planning or whatever you guys do, think of us here. Absolutely, and thank you for highlighting that. South Africa is part of the plan. Actually, we have already been working here for the last two years. Okay, we haven't made a lot of noise. Uh, we didn't reach out to the Muslim community here because we were extremely busy in uh, East Africa and uh, Southeast Africa, for example, Malawi and Tanzania and these countries. Okay, South Africa, we had, uh, we already have a team in Johannesburg. Okay, they're working. Uh, we had a small team in Cape Town, so we have uh, we started with South Africa. South Africa is one of the countries where we started. Uh, okay, we actually did interviews here, right here, IPCI. Remember, uh, Brother Muhammad remembers. So we we intend to not only hire the art here. We we want to intend. I mean, we want to hire at least a thousand. Okay, and I'm not speaking, you know, uh, without thinking. Uh, we have calculated. And thousand is nothing, you know. A thousand people giving dawa in South Africa full time, it is nothing. When I say nothing, I mean when we get to South Africans, we haven't yet, yet got to their nerves. Okay, we we plan to get to their nerves, you know, get on some people's nerves, as they say, you know. We haven't actually reached out yet to the real big influencers here. Inshallah, we we plan to do that. Inshallah, this is only the beginning, right? So once we have mobilized influencers or influential people here and uh, possibly some uh, uh, people who have the, and you know it doesn't have to be rich people it doesn't have to be rich people our brothers and sisters who are normal outgoing working class people they do wonders they do more than some of these rich people do okay uh, because they they not only support financially but they support physically. These are the people we need to mobilize. So in no time, give us few years, one or two years, you will have a huge number of du'at actively doing dawah in the rural areas, inshallah. Uh, so it, it's coming, okay? Just as it's happening in Malawi, Rwanda, uh, Tanzania, it's going to happen here as well. And that's why we are here, inshallah. Yes, uh, Brother Muhammad, and then we'll come to the sister, inshallah. What is, I think it's just in one is that the, the, the mission activity in these areas to attack Muslims hmm. or to get Muslims out of Islam yeah. is on a very high level of okay. missionary activity. Okay. The Dawah is being done hmm. at the, the Chatsworth Dawah office, IPC at Chatsworth Dawah office. Hmm. We had four encounters where, hmm. firstly, the, uh, uh, one attorney was a Christian reported us for doing dawah on the street, making noise. Okay. The second person called the fire marshal. Mm. The third person called the, the labor office. Okay. See, uh, this gentleman here who works there, who's in the office, whether he's employed by us. Okay. The fourth one is putting Arabic missionary literature against Islam in our work. Brother Tariq has been troubling me because when he took Shahada with us, would take Mr. Manu Kadu and, and, and IBC formalized it. His pastor brought two Christian missionaries who worked in Saudi Arabia mm. to attack him the entire night. The next day he called me. Mm. Eventually, we had to go to the church and he had to state why he left Christianity to come to Islam. Mm. And they brought two people to debate against us. Mm. And eventually, he has his reasons and he, he told him, but the, the onslaught has not stopped. Right. His argument with me is, mm. why aren't we knocking on the church's doors and trying to get the people who have left Islam? Mm. Uh, it's uh, a topic for when we finish each other. Yeah, 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 definitely. And we are already, we have the same situation in Malawi, right? Uh, we have lost territory there. Uh, and we lose to this day, okay? But uh, Hafiz Faisal is a very uh, interesting character. He's from Malawi, he's well known. He said, okay, if we are losing territory in one place and we are not able to do anything there, uh, we are taking territory in another place, right? So as long as, as long as we don't stop, and dawah is dynamic. When I say it's dynamic, it spreads. Islam 
is so powerful that it speaks for itself. It attracts people on its own merits. It doesn't need eloquent speakers or PhD doctors to represent Islam. I mean, some, most, most du'as in the world who have been debating Christians, okay, most of them are not anywhere near uh, the, the qualification the Christians have, right? Some of them are PhDs and PhDs and they know the Greek language, they know the Hebrew language, and yet they lose debates. They're so eloquent, they actually go through courses on oratory, on how to speak and how to present their faith, and yet they lose debates because they don't have the haq. How are you going to defend Trinity? How are you going to defend the Bible? The Bible is actually the biggest uh, defense of Islam, I say. The Bible, <laughs> you know, the Quran because they don't believe in it. The Bible is the biggest defense for Islam. I believe there is, if, you, if we show them the Bible, if they read it carefully, it, it the Bible is, uh, we, I've met people, they said, Bible brought us to Islam, not the Quran. We never read the Quran. We read the Bible carefully. Okay? We met a blind pastor in Malawi, a, a blind, blind, cannot see, pastor, and he accepted Islam. So I asked him, and the video, you might find it on YouTube, is there. We interviewed him. I asked him, how, how did you accept Islam? You can't see, and you didn't even read the Quran. He said, when I read the Bible, because I'm blind, so blind people, you know, the other faculties are working more than normal people. So I used to think that what I am teaching, I hear the Muslims doing this. Because what I hear of the Muslims, they are doing these things, what the Bible is. So I could see that this, these people, they are not serious. These people are not serious. So that's why I accepted Islam. So it's, it's, there are so many examples. So the struggle continues, Brother Muhammad. And Brother Tariq, struggle continues, okay? This, will, this is something we cannot stop, okay? This cross-pollination of faiths, okay, is going to continue. But the question is, where do we stand? What are we doing to do our da'wah, okay? Uh, debates are a branch of da'wah. They're not the da'wah, okay? Uh, da'wah, I believe, is actually going out, calling people to Allah, take territory, take, go and uh, take a, a district, take a town, or take an entire region and build a team there and you see what will happen. You will see wonders happening. You may, while you may leave, 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 lose 5, 10, 20, 30 people in one place, you'll be gaining a thousand in another place. This is how Dawah works, right? Even the Sahaba, some of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, they ended up leaving. One or two people here and there, no problem. One, when, uh, immigration, when uh, they migrated to Habasha, one of the people who was Muslim, he apostatized. He went to Christianity. So what? But there are uh, another 100,000 people who accepted Islam with the Prophet ﷺ, including Christians. Including Christians. So guidance is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If it's for you, it will come to you. Okay? Allah will make people come to you. So we have to, we, we have to make sure that we continue with the struggle. We don't stop. No matter what happens, whatever we, we may be doing in our lives, we have to do da'wah. We have to do da'wah. Even if you are a sinner, if you are not a, the best Muslim, if you think, oh, I shouldn't be doing da'wah because I sin. No, this is a whisper from shaitan. You must do da'wah because it's a good deed. Do you stop praying? If you sin, do you stop praying? A sinner needs it more. A sinner <laughs> needs it more. He needs to pray more so that his sins can be forgiven. So if you do da'wah, Allah will forgive your sins and Allah will bring you closer to himself. So this is why we need to continue, whoever we are, wherever we are. Anyone, a sister, you had a question. Yes. Absolutely. I was also coming to like ABCI because I think they did a tremendous job against all odds. Yes. You know, we've got a very violent society. I, I think you must be aware. Yes. So yes. there's danger lurking all the time. All we need, sister, all we need is an avalanche of dua. And it can happen, you know. One person, like just like Sheikh Ahmad Didat, you know, uh, we because time when we have seen Sheikh Ahmad Didat and his legacy, and then these organizations popping up due to his influences, because all of these individuals are somehow, uh, one way or another, they are inspired by him, right? So th this is one example. There will be other examples coming in the future, inshallah. People will look up to them. Do you know about David Livingston? David Livingston, do you know, have you heard of his name? 
Have you heard about him? David Livingston was a missionary who came to Sub-Saharan Africa to draw a map to find routes okay, for the colonial powers. He came as a spy or uh, you know, to, to gather information. At the same time, he was a missionary, right? And he died in Africa. Uh, he died in 1870s. He was an absolute failure. Personally, his own struggle to convert Africans to Christianity failed. He, he failed miserably. But he succeeded in something huge. Something huge. What was that? He set a precedent. He set a precedent. His story was told repeatedly in Victorian Britain. He was on the matchboxes. He was on candles. He was on cups. He was on, you know, uh, cutlery. He, he, his name was everywhere. So the Victorians sold his example to the entire society. So there was a story about him that he, he was attacked by a lion. While he was in the way of the Christ, yeah, he was attacked by a lion. And that image is very famous. Okay, you will see if you Google David Livingston attacked by lion, you will see m multiple images. Uh, he is he, underneath a lion and the lion is top on, and he was actually injured by a lion. This is true. This happened. He was One of his arms was permanently damaged because he was attacked by a lion, right? That image, even though he was a failure, he failed as a missionary, right? But that image, it drove so many people to become missionaries in the way of the Christ, right? And they started to come to African countries. So what happened here? Why am I telling you about him? He became a precedent, an example of sacrifice. And his example was sold. It was sold to people. And people became convinced. And that's why you have so many places dedicated to him. In Botswana, in Zambia, in Malawi, in Zimbabwe, right? There are cities like Livingstonia. Okay, Victoria Falls were discovered by him, even though the natives had called it the, the, the cloud that thunders, they had a local name for it, but he discovered, you know, just like Christopher Columbus discovered America, he discovered Victoria Falls, as if the natives didn't know where, where Victoria Falls is, right? Okay, so it was named after Victoria. Then the city of Blantyre is named after his birthplace. He was born in Blantyre in Scotland, right? So all of this came from him coming to Africa, okay, making, a, making an example out of himself, and then selling this example through newspapers and missionary uh, reports and all that. This is how we need to sing our heroes. We need to talk more about du'at and their sacrifices and their examples so that our youth can be inspired. That if these guys can do it and they did this and they gave this in the path of da'wah, we can also do it. We need to actually start talking. Why do we get so inspired by the example of the Prophet and Sahaba? Because we are told these stories by the ulama. The ulama and the members, they tell us about the Sahaba. When they want us to do something, how do they drive us? Look at what Umar did. Look at what Abu Bakr, look at what Uthman did, right? And then it drives us. Just like that, we need local current examples of du'at and you people will become those people. Okay, you can become those Muslim living uh, David Livingstons. Not that he was upon the hak or the truth, <laughs> yeah. But we can do better than that. We just need to sell our heroes. Yes, sell to Muslims, by the way, not to. <laughs> okay. Good. Wallahi, very good question. And some people have actually woken up to that. You're right, absolutely. Uh, China, also another example. Okay, the Buddhists. We have we have ignored the Buddhists. We have ignored the atheists. Uh, at there is work happening on atheism. But you're absolutely right. One billion Hindus. What's going to happen to them? Who's going to reach out to them? So there are people who are working on that. Uh, Dr. Zakir Naik was trying his best. He did a good job there. He was he did an amazing job. He actually quoted Hindu scriptures to reach out, and that's why he was shut down, no doubt. He was shut down because thousands, thousands upon thousands were converting to Islam, okay? Thousands. There are, in India, there are hundreds of thousands of Hindus, they hide their Islam because of fear, right? But they are there, they're there, okay? So if we start focusing on them and start reaching out to them, of course, of course, no doubt, absolutely. So when things are more conducive in India, 
you will see. I mean, actually, we had a team in India, by the way. Aero had a team in India, and we had to evacuate our team uh, for obvious reasons because their lives were threatened. They were told, uh, you shut down your system or, or else, right? So we had to actually move our team out of India to Malaysia. So they had to leave the country. So, yeah. On that note, I think we have to roll up. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to me, brothers and sisters. And again, keep in mind, those of you who want to support, or if you cannot support, go and get support. If you know people who can support, take the model to them, and inshallah ta'ala, try to do this as much as you can. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Jazakallah khair, brothers and sisters. Um, as you can see, this is the, the amount that we're looking to support. There's a donation form here. Alhamdulillah, we have a bank account in South Africa. You can do donate and support us. Um, something that's very, very important for all of you to know. IERA is a level one DAO organization. What does a level one DAO organization mean? We focus on calling the general public, the people in the villages, the people in the street of Islam. Okay? You don't need to know the Bible. You don't need to... Uh, you know, may Allah bless Ahmad Didad, Dr. Zakhir Naik, these have got special powerful memory Allah has blessed them with. Okay, our da'wah training and we teach people to give da'wah, anyone can give da'wah. Just like all of you can drive a car, you just need to train to drive a car. But not all of us can drive a Formula One car. These are for special people who can uh, are specialized in this field. So you can even visit our website, you can go to training.iera.org. Uh, it's shown here training.ira.org. We have an online da'wah training course where we teach people how to give da'wah. You can log in and do these courses. We have a Christianity course. And actually, one of the modules is why not use, why we shouldn't use the Bible in da'wah, okay? For the general people. Of course, Adnan and other people who are specialized, no problem. But for us, people like me and you, you know, you don't really need to use the Bible to give da'wah. So do attend this course. They also have new Muslim mentorship uh, program called. Jazakallah khair, barakallah fiqh. Thank you all very much for coming, Mr. Adnan and me. And we have Mudassar Anjum, who is our country manager from Malawi. We're here, inshallah, having dinner with you all. If you have any questions or inquiries, we're here available to help. And if you want to give a donation, make a pledge, there's a pledge from here. If you can't, you want to other ways, you can always come to Muhammad Khan. Allah bless him, reward him, raise his rank in this world and the next for open the door for us. Usually when an organization, they, me, myself and I, but no, they open the door for us in order to work together in order to, because the most important thing is mission supremacy. Calling people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and raising Allah's name to the highest. Jazakallah khair. Thank you.